Jesus' name. Father Lord, you are the ancient of days, the omnipotent and the omniscient God, the one and the only wise God, the God who controls the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that lives there in earth. Father Lord, what shall we say therefore if you be for us who can be against us? You did not spare your son Jesus Christ. You gave him as an atonement for us. That through him we know he will give us all things, include all the benefit of life. That's why tonight we stand in a way of your presence to exalt and to honor the God who laid the foundation of the heaven. To thank him whose name we have our being. We glorify the Lord to whom all the family of the earth received their original name. Holy Spirit, we gather once again in your presence to hear from you, to receive from your altar of grace. Teach us, O Lord, for no man can do anything except it is given him from above. Lord, grant us your grace to assess your presence and your honor to tarry in your presence. Holy Spirit, let your word not be compromised. Teach us in wisdom. Guide us with understanding that your name alone will be glorified. For our Lord, as many that come with a heart of expectation, they come with sickness, with body, with pain, with tortures in their mind. Lord, you will meet them at the very point of your name. You will send your word to all that are sick and heal them from their diseases. As many that sit in darkness, let great light shine. As many that dwell in the valley of the shadow of death, O Lord God of hosts, light has risen. Father, let every barren womb receive fruits. Let all those that sit in darkness, let light shine. Let those that are cast down be lifted up. Let the poor that are poor in the Lord say we are rich. That in everything that the name of the Lord our God be glorified from generation to generation. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Brethren, today we thank God once again for exalting his name and bringing us to his presence. Because the Bible said, in his presence we are contents. In the presence there is life. Expression of righteousness, power, wisdom and mind. Because in the presence of the Lord we have contentment. Oh, because he has defeated death and has put all things under complete control. Father Lord, we exalt and honor you. We thank you for your name this evening. Because we know even tonight we honor your word even more than your name. For in Jesus' name we pray. Well, tonight we are welcome back to Open Heart Fellowship. My name is Missionary Collins. I will be your teacher for this evening. And our topic for today is quite a simple one. Building the church. And when we talk about building the church, many Christians who does study their scripture will conclude, oh, maybe you want to talk about fundraising, <laughs> or you want to talk about how to lay the foundation block of a ministry. No. When we talk about building the church, we are talking about building the Christians. Because you are the church of God. God is talking about building up your faith in your most holy faith. And that is what we talk about when we say building the church of God. Christians need to be built up, to be prepared to receive from the Lord, and to eat from His table, and to grow in the foundation, and to become that church which the Lord said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and that the gate of hell will not prevail against it. That is the church we're talking about. We're not just talking about building a building. We are talking about building a church that the gate of hell will never have dominion over. Building a church that will stand the test of time. The church that will not faint despite all the intent in the world. That is the church we are talking about tonight. Our text tonight is taken from the book of Revelation chapter 19 from verse 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 to 32. That is where our text is taken from. Today, if you are joining us for the first time, this is CGF Open Heart Fellowship. CGF Open Heart Fellowship. We meet every Tuesday by 7 p.m. Swedish time. 
Nigeria time is about or GMT is about 8 p.m. So that is the time we meet. We only meet for one hour where we use opportunity to expose Christians who want to serve the Lord in a deeper meaning to grow in their faith and to prepare them for the work of the ministry. And that is the purpose of this training. This training is a non-denominational, it is not a service church, nor is it for attached to a particular church affiliation. This teaching is for every believer, especially those who want to serve the law on a higher call or on a higher level. And that is the reason why this teaching is necessary for every believer to participate. And even for unbelievers who are just coming to the law, we expose you because the Bible says, knowing the wrath of God, we expose, it will strengthen men and he will transform people. God's word will be ministered to you in this teaching. We are not going to make decisions for you. The word will be given to you so that you can make decisions for yourself to save life in this present world. That is the reason why we receive such a lesson. The lesson is not leading. We are not trying to force you to believe what we believe or to change your doctrine or tradition. The purpose of this teaching is to bring the facts before you so that you can study for yourself. That's why Paul says, the barriers were made noble than the Thessalonica, in that when they heard the word, they take it home, they accept it with gladness, but they went home searching the scripture, if those things they heard were true. Some words can be very fascinating and very sweet to hear in the ear, but the question is, are they true? Does it take you to the sky? Because then some writers say, let others see Jesus in you. While going through this world of sin, and they ask themselves, your life is a book before their eyes, and they are reading you true and true. And they ask themselves one simple question. Not what you say. Does your life as a Christian point them to the sky? If they follow your footsteps, and they live the way you live, are they sure they will make it to heaven? Let others see Jesus in you. That is the today teaching, building the church of God. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly realm, to principalities and power, to the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So that was the intent. So before we start, let's go straight to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 10. Ephesians 3 10. What does it say? Ephesians 3 10 says, let me read from King James. He said, to the intent that now unto the principality and power in heavenly places might be made known, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom. You see, it is not very clear. To make it clearer, we will read from verse 8, which says, To me, though I am very least of all the saints, God consecrated people and favored privilege and was granted and graciously entrusted to proclaim to the Gentile the unending and the boundless phantomless and incalculable and inexhaustible riches of Christ, which, which no man being, no human being could set out. In King James it says, Unto me who was less than the least of all the same is the grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Why do I read from two translations? For you to understand what the unsearchable mean. What he's talking about is the boundless, phantomless, and incalculable and inexhaustible riches of Christ. That is the phantomless riches of Christ. And that is exactly why in verse 9 he goes further to make us understand what verse 10 was actually talking about. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The fellowship of the mystery. But when we talk about mystery, mystery is a secret. Mystery 
is a secret. And what he's saying here, the fellowship of the mystery, mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, was kept in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And also to enlighten all men and make plain to them what is the plain regarding Gentile, providing for the salvation of all men, for the mystery kept hidden through the ages and concealed until now in the mind of God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto principalities and powers in the heavenly place might be known by the church the manifold wisdom. To the intent that principalities and power may be known by the church. That is the purpose. And that was the purpose why Ephesians 3 verse 10 was written. To make known to us the undiluted word of God. What is a church? Is the church the building that was started by Constantine in the AD? Or was the church the basilica in Rome? Or was the church Hagia Sophia in Turkey? Or what is the church? Or synagogue of power in Lagos? Or the late Abishop church? What is the church? Whether we are talking about the universal church in all the world, or whether we are referring to the local church around the corner, church is always the people. And never, never the building. However nice it may be, we are the church. The only house <coughs> of God, of the Lord, is us. Those religious social buildings are not God's church. It doesn't matter your religions or your creed or your tradition. The moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become the church. So for you to be the church, you have to understand the unsearchable riches of Christ, which he has conditioned unto us. The church is always the people and never the building. And the Lord himself understood this. And so does the New Testament apostle understood this. So right from the early days, people never really have money to build big buildings or magnificent mansion in the name of God. Some were worshipping in cave of the mountain, rocks, cover. Some worship in their house, breaking bread from house to house. Wherever the people of God are gathered is the church. It doesn't matter how small or how large it is, it is the church. The importance of church. Church is the house, is the father's purpose. In Ephesians 3, chapter 10, to make known to the principalities and power about the raising Christ. That is the purpose of Christ, of the church. The church is the promise of the Son. It is the promise of the Son. The church is Christ himself promise that upon this rock, in Matthew 16 verse 18, upon this rock I will build my church and that the gate of hell will not prevail against it. The church was one result of the Holy Spirit arrival in Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 47. That is what the church, how was the church born? In Acts chapter 2, let's read Acts chapter 2 from verse Acts chapter 2 from verse 42 to 47. For 42 he said, 
They steadfastly, they steadfastly preserve, devote themselves constantly to instruction and following the apostles to the breaking of bread, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. And a sense of aware, reverential fear came upon them, upon every soul. Many signs and wonders were performed through the apostles and special messages. And all who believed, who are held and trusted in and rely on Christ, we are united together and they have everything in common. 45. And so their possession goes and pass them to all men as every man has need. And Day after day, they regularly assemble in the temple with united purpose in their home. They break bread, includes the Lord's Supper. They partook of their food with gladness and simplicity and generosity of heart. Lastly, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Always remember, the Lord did not add to the building. The Lord added to the people. The Lord added to the church, which is the people. The church in Antioch was planted by ordinary believers, made strong by gifted men. In Acts chapter 11, verse 19 to 26, planting one was one. Church planting was one of Paul's major goal, which today in mission we actually call fellowship. We set up fellowship in every town we go so that people can have access to the true word of God. In Acts 13, Acts 14, 23, and 19, 20 and 17. God is blessing new churches, plant movement all over the world. What does God's church look like? Spiritually, in Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27 says, What the church is loved by Jesus and he gave himself to her with undivided attention. And a good church belongs, becomes holy, clean, full of the word of God, fit to be presented to Jesus as a desirable and beautiful bride, without stain, wrinkle, blameless, in every way. So that is the church Christ is talking about. So when we talk about the church, do not mistake me. Oh. They say they are mission, they don't build church. Now we're talking about church, yes. The church we're talking about is the church of God, you, not the building. Because the building cannot be without blemish. The building cannot be a bride prepared for Christ. I don't think Christ is coming on the last day to write your building to heaven or to carry the desirable gift in the church or on the altar or the beautiful car to heaven. No. He is coming for a bride without spots or rico. A bride that is blameless in every way. That is who Christ is coming at. The church as we know it is actually the assembly of the saints. The assembly of the saints. Only the saints assembled is called church. Whenever two or three saints are assembled together in the name of the Lord and God dwells in their midst, it's a church. Although everyone says Amen and one or and what this for their church, notice that the context is all about marriage. So let's understand Ephesians chapter 5 in regard to what Christ is talking about, what each the church should look like. 
what the duty of the pastor, who is supposed to be the leader of the church, job is. Efficient. Chapter 5. Efficient chapter 5. Ephesians 5 from verse 25 to 27. 25 says, Husband, love your wife. Husband, love your wife. What? Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You have to be spared as the minister and be spared for the gospel of God. Because husband loved their wife and they gave themselves for it. Because that's what Christ did. Christ loved the church. He gave his life for it. So if you want to be a servant of Christ, you can never be a self who are ready to serve and give your life for the church. So, a time will come in the Christian dog that anybody that kills you will think you do God's service. So you must arm yourself. Christ suffered after the flesh. You must act, arm yourself in like manner to suffer. Because anybody that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Notice the context is all about Christ's marriage. Husbands are expected to love their wife, to protect them, to nourish them. And that can be done. Can we do better? Yes, as a church, we are expected to love the brethren, protect the brethren, nourish the brethren with spiritual gift and power. What does 26 say? So that he might sanctify her. So that Christ might sanctify the church. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God. Notice here, the word of God is the water of cleansing. The church without the gospel is a dead church. It cannot be washed from sin. You need the water. Of the word of God to cleanse the church and to nourish and protect the church. More word of God is needed. The depth of the knowledge you have because faith comes by hearing. Faith does not come by reading. Faith comes by hearing. And what do you hear? The word of God. The more you hear, the more your faith is built up. And that's why the church must be well nourished. To be able to provide the living word of God. Remember that this book of the Lord should not depart from your mouth. In it you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Without the word of God, there is a limit you can go. Your spiritual life will be weakened and you will be malnourished. The more you stay away from study, the more you are tempted to sin. Christians must understand that it takes study to guide this thing. Faith can only be built by knowledge. The more knowledge you have in the Word of God, the more your faith is built up to stand against the terror of this world. In verse 27, which is our last, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Notice Christ is talking about marriage here, but he jumped to the conclusion, presenting the marriage to himself as a glorious church. So ask yourself a question. Is Christ going to preserve and protect beauty and present it to himself as a glorious church? No. Christ is going to present the comfort, not the church, beauty, to himself as a glorious church, not having any spots or Rico, or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. What 
does a good church look like in practice? Look at the illustration on the page. What does a good church actually look like? You will say it is a form of pantry or other trees like mango, orange trees, whatever. In fact, it is called a tree of life. We have the pastor who really grasps the revelation from the Spirit of God. The invisible route to the depths. A good church has invisible hidden roots that go deep under the surface, actually seeking the life that only comes from the living water of God, which is the word of God. Therefore, a depth foundation is vital. The more knowledge you have in the word of God, the more you excel in God. Because you heard Jesus says all the folk were true. Most of them fell into the good ground. Even the one that fell into the good ground, they did not bear the same seed. Why? The reason is because the knowledge varies. When your knowledge varies, your labor varies. So to more who more one who much is given, much more is expected. If you are given more knowledge of the things of God, God expected more from you. If you are given less knowledge, God expected less from you. But sometimes you can see your supervision. And if there is nothing wrong after you have used up all the knowledge you are given, ask for more. And God will increase what you have. But you don't have to keep the one you have and keep asking. Most of all in Africa, we have that habit. We have a gift from God. Maybe you are an excellent evangelist, but you can evangelize to everybody. You say, God, I want to be a miracle worker. God, I want to be a miracle worker. What about the one God has given you? Have you ever used it? Do the work of evangelists. Show a full proof of your ministry. God himself, who is the author and the finisher of your faith, he walked over you. He's able to do above what you can take, ask or even imagine. He knew when you need healing. He knew when you need apostleship. He knew when you need the gift of miracle worker. He knew when you need the gift of a prophet. He will give it to you in his own time. Therefore, the deep is vital in prayer with wisdom from the word of God. And God says, love. Do you know it was not of a technical error, but a deliberate. When God started the Ten Commandments with the word, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Your foundation should be built on that faith. There is one true living God. That is the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Therefore, you must not make unto me any graven image in any form, likeness of things in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. It was clear. The first commandment is not to make unto the Lord any form of graven image. And the second one is that thou must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your power and with all your substance. That is it. Somebody will ask a strange place in the book of Acts when Ananias and the rest were selling Timothy the son of consolation went and sold all that he has and bring it to the church not caring about his future. People wonder these people were they foolish? Were they not wise? Why would they sell all they have and bring it to the church? Because they understood, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thy heart, with all thy might, and with all thy strength. But what is the second? The second is like it: thou shalt love thy neighbor 
as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This all the prophets and all the laws hang on this. Do to others what you want others to do to you. If you want others to cut off your head whenever you are walking on the street, do it to others. If you want others to bless you, bless others. If you want others to curse you, curse others. If you, for example, you were a witch and you want people to throw you out on the street and kill you, then kill the witch. But if you know fully well you were out of mistake, possessed when you were little, and you want because of that mistake for people to crucify you, then do the same to others. What you want others to do to you, do to them. That is the laws and the prophets. Christianity is not a religion. It's not based on arithmetic and solutions or some theologians explaining implicit theories to you. It's a moral living. It's a characteristic of moral living. The whole Bible is written on those doctrines. Do to others what you want others to do to you. That's what the prophet preached about. That's what the laws wrote about. That's what Christ himself teaches. In prayers with wisdom, the word of God, love, power from the Holy Spirit himself. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 to 8. Even someone, let us read. Someone. Someone. What does someone say? He said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the ways of sinner, nor seated in the seat of the scornful, but blessed and happy is he. But his delight is in the law of his God. In this law he meditates day and night. Do you know what happened to that man in verse 3? He shall be like a tree, just like we explained, planted by the rivers of water and bring forth fruits in each season. And the Bible says his leaf does not wither. So instead of going to Martin to fast for 40 days for financial breakthrough, just follow the principle. The principle is simple. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the cancer of the <clears throat> not standing in the way of sinner, but his delight is in the law of his God. On his law he meditates day and night. And the Bible says that man will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That means he does not need rainy season. He is evergreen. He does not need dry season. This man is evergreen. He drew, his root went directly into the living water and it tapped from it. And he sustained his life even when the red root of the trees are dried up. His life is always sustained. He will be full of age. And he is nourished. The Bible says, such man, what happened to it? His leaf does not fade. He does not share his leaf. His leaf does not fade at all. That means he is always able to repair his leaf. He never go hungry. And his leaf can never wither because the source of water is genuine. And everything he does, he prosper. If he put hand in business, the business will prosper. If he put hand in marriage, marriage will prosper. If he put hand in ministry, ministry will prosper. Whatever that man touch must prosper and they come to maturity. But what does it say in verse 4? It says, but the ungodly are not so. The unbelievers are not so. Those who refuse to follow the principles of that is read down in the scripture, they are not so. Even though they live inside a building called church, even though they live inside a place called, called mosque, or even though they live inside a temple in India called Buddha's temple, it doesn't matter. The Lord says, the wicked are not so. The wicked are not so, but they are like what? Chaff with the wind drives away. They are like chaffs. Ordinary wind. Now, room of the portion, wicked. 
English people say rumor for show the wicked rumor. They just hear the sound of bed. They say, My enemy has come. Oh, behold, my life is finished. They run away because they are faithless. The difference between Christian and devil is not understanding the scripture, it's faith. Faith is the only difference between Christian and devil. And the moment you are a Christian, you don't have faith, you and devil are no different. Because do you believe in God? The devil also believes in God and he struggles. But the difference is that he has no faith. So faith is what divides you. So let's go back to our study. The trunk divided into three segmented parts. The trunk is the most visible part of the tree. It grows into stage as the seed grows to the shoot. When it grows, it becomes strong, lasting and resistant to the winds. That is what the storm is. That is the trunk. And that's why everybody that wants to attack the tree, attack the tree from the trunk. If you want to cut the tree down, you don't go for the leaf. You don't go for the branches. You go for the trunk. So anybody that wants to destroy the church does not go attacking each member. He go for the pastor. He go for the leaders of the church. The trunk. The prayer warrior. The team of evangelists that hold the body together. The warriors in prayer, the, the those that beautify God through songs, the chorister, the devils set into their midst and it destabilized the whole church, which then grows to become strong, lasting and resistant to the means. <coughs> based on evangelism, a good the base of it is the evangelism. Evangelism is the base of the trunk of the tree. A good church begins in a visible ministry with evangelism. And of course, never cease to evangelize throughout its lifetime. Without constant evangelism, it is many forms people will remain in their sins and ignorance to God will, no matter the number in the church. Why do we evangelize? Simply because Jesus said we should. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus clearly says, go and preach the gospel to all nations. He said you should go and preach. So you must preach. Except you want to disobey Jesus. He did not put variation that only evangelists should preach. Or only pastors are allowed to preach. Or only some spiritual leaders are allowed to preach. Preaching is for every believer. So if you are obedient to Christ, you have to preach the gospel. The mid-session strength of the disciple, the trunk grows and becomes too strong, and becomes strong to support the tree and the destiny of the fruit bearer. And it also serves as a transport to carry nutrient from the roots to the leaves. Without one moment ceasing to proclaim the good news, a good church will show dedicated much time to turning the new convert into disciple. That is the only way. That's what Jesus said. He said, go and make disciple. He didn't say, go and make convert of all nations. He said, go and make disciple of all nations. Because if you save a convert, you have one soul. But if you save, a, if you make a disciple, you have thousands of souls. That's why in CGF, we focus our ministry on building people into discipleship, irrespective of their ministry. They may not be a disciple and stay with us, but they can be a disciple on their own and be able to bring God to their families and their friends and their community. That is the purpose of growing disciples. Next, it will turn those disciples into leaders. That means you have saved a generation. And we can neither take responsibility to advance God's work. How can a disciple become a leader? A disciple follows instruction. Leaders plan the work. They spend from the self. They are spent and being spent for the gospel of God. 
and their life is given to the work. Why do we consider discipleship training to be so important simply because Jesus said, make disciples? Make disciples. And that is the purpose of this training. This training is not only for you to accept Christ. This training is to build you into a disciple. To make you understand that Christianity only functions if we all are disciples. There can never be too many. The world is big. We have a lot of community to cover. We have a lot of country to cover. We have a lot of time to bring the gospel to. We have a lot of languages. That's why when we make more disciples, the communities learn various languages. And when our disciples learn three or four languages, that is the highest their brain can carry. But when we train people in those indigenous of those languages, they can better relate to people than train experts who learn the language in school. And that is the reason why we make disciples of all nations, of all tongues, of all tribes, of all villages, of all languages. That is the purpose. And that's what the church is actually about. Not building some fancy temple. The top, the noble height of care for the poor. Oh, caring for the poor. Is it important? I thought the church was supposed to care for the poor. Yes. The reason why it is difficult today for church to care for poor is not because they lack of they lack care. No. It's because they gather themselves together in one place. So as a result of that, they hardly see the needs of those outside. But when you, when the church is in every home, the church is in every community, the church is in every town, they will be able to minister to the poor better. They will not need a pastor to tell them, oh, this man needs food. Because the Bible teaches us himself, do to others what you want others to do to you. I would be happy if I'm hungry tomorrow and I saw a brother and said, please, I have to go for bread. Take one. So also, if I see a, hunger, a beggar who needs a loaf of bread or a pair of jeans and I have to, I will be considering to give him one. So the same thing God expects from us, that we also, if we are in bondage, we cannot save others. If all of us are just a convert under a church and not a leader, not a disciple, the church will never move forward. It doesn't matter how many millions of converts we are, we are just one one. We are not doing anything for Christ. But when you convert those converts into disciples, and when you convert disciples into leaders, they bring out God in every community. And they convert other people. Each disciple can save another 12 disciples. Because the who went to witness for Christ? It was not Christ himself that went on to the 12 tribe of Israel. It was the disciples. Jesus trained the disciples. The disciples went and saved, convert. The disciples trained 70. And 70 trained 500. And that was how it went. And by the time we get to the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000. So what of if Christ has refused to train the twelve? Christ will still have twelve converts on earth who come to church every Sunday and pay their tithes and give offering and their job ends. Without for one moment ceasing to evangelize and make disciples, a good church will not follow the example of Christ in Acts one one and ten verse thirty eight by doing good. More than three. Hundred times the Bible, God declared His love for the poor and the needy. He expects His body, the church, to be caring and handless, to be His caring hand and His caring lips for the poor. The Bible says, "What man will say, I love my brother, and he sees?" His brother in captivity and he does not help him out. How do the love of God in such a person? Love not in words, but in deed. Not everyone is called to preach. No. Some people cannot just preach. But they can teach. Some people cannot preach, teach, but they can preach. 
So people cannot even preach or teach, but they are very industrious. They can provide for the church. So whatever way you choose to serve God, serve God. But every believer can show God mercy to the poor, particularly to the widows and the children who are orphans. I don't mean going there for your own selfish interest to adopt all the children. No. I mean caring for them in their orphanages. Showing them parental care even when you don't need to adopt any child. What's happened instead of taking ripping children off their parents? You actually go there and locate the parents of those children who abandoned them because of poverty and you assist those parents to take care of those children, to train them in academics and to make sure that the responsibility, the reason why they ran away from it, you help them to meet it. Will the child not be more grateful growing up with his natural parents than an adopted parent? So think about this course. Ask yourself a question. Sometimes we care. The Bible says if we give our body to be born, but we did it not in love, it profits us nothing. So if actually you love the people, don't care about your selfish day. Put your gain aside. Put your selfishness of heart aside. Concentrate on God's care, God's love, God's kindness. As you see in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 to 45. James chapter 1, verse 27. God passion for this poor. God have a particular passion for the poor. And that's why he told you, a great and undoctrated religious before the world is this, that thou should visit the fatherless, and that thou should care for the widow, that the eyes of a beggar within your gates is not allowed to draw. That is the religion that is acceptable to God. Not whether you are a Christian, Muslim, or Islam, or whatever. No. God wants you to visit the poor with bread. And the eyes of the needies in your gates are not cast down. James 1, verse 27. James 1, verse 27. A pure religion and undefined before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. That is the religion God requires from you. It's not he has taken my sorrows away every Sunday. Yes, God has taken your sorrows away. Why not busy taking other people's sorrows away? What if you go to a church and you been there to pray for a contract? Which you have been waiting for for years, and there come a beggar who came there to pay for a hard strength of twenty dollars. Don't you think it would be wise for you to put your hand into his pocket, help the beggar to meet the needs of the rent of twenty dollars while you pray for your contract? Don't you think your prayer will be answered faster if you do that than crying for the good day? A shady foliage. Is the covering of a kingdom economy. Here is the issue that many churches neglect at their career. Think about this. Prayer and the grace of God for the roots is absolutely free. For evangelism costs something. Discipleship costs a lot more. Caring for the poor is very costly. <coughs> Where will the money come from? And now consider this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, we read before. And 4, verse 32 to 35, we find the church in Jerusalem to be so worthy that there were no need, needy person among them. The people lack nothing. How possible is this? The church in Jerusalem was so rich, the people does not need anything. Some years later, 
that same great church was in such poverty that Paul was raising offering for them in the new churches. How possible is that? The church in Jerusalem that was the wealthiest that made nothing. So yet they can become so poor to the extent Paul was raising offering for them from other churches. Across Europe. What happened? In Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 9, the leader delegated issue of racism, discrimination, finance to several good Grecian men. Properly preacher. Properly preachers. So that the leaders no longer handled the finances. The preacher liked preaching, not paper. That preaching sadly cost Stephen his life. And then Philip went to Samaria. If the five Grecians were also preaching and scattered by the Acts 8, verse 1, persecution, who was handling the economy? Anybody? What do we know about it? <laughs> the poor surely came from far and wide, hearing that means we are met. Heard the gospel, received Jesus, and joined the church. So the expenses increased. But income did not increase. So that is the problem with the church today. The lesson is clear. Unless someone, probably not the main preachers, take serious responsibility for the church economy using faith and work, poverty will not be at will always be at the door of believers. It doesn't matter how much you pray. Why is handling the money so important? Simply because Jesus did so. Jesus said so. In Luke chapter 19, verse 11 to 26. Let's read. Luke. Oh, we don't have time. Sorry. We just have to move to the next one. Finances of God's kingdom. So we will get more into that when we get to the finances of God's kingdom. So finally, let's get some clear understanding. The fruit seed is the in the wind. The fruit seeds in the wind of God. A good church will always bear fruit in what? It's season. The fruit bring glory to God. Same in every new baby tree of a faith of a daughter church or of a daughter fellowship springing up in a village, springing up in a community, nearby and far away through mission. Each new tree has its own roots in God. Remember, evangelist discipleship is only complete when a disciple bear fruit. You can be a disciple forever if you don't bear fruit. Your discipleship training only concludes at best. Just as a girl will end her guestship in motherhood, so the same way a disciple ends at best, giving birth to another convert. That is when you become a disciple. And your job of giving birth is not completed until that your convert is also trained to become a disciple. And when your convert becomes a disciple, you expect the convert to learn what you learn so that he can train another convert to become a disciple. But by the time you are the only one who is able to train your convert to become a disciple, that means there is a problem wrong with your church. You are not either not a good teacher or you should look for teacher. Own finance and cover and fruits. So, now what do we learn from this? We learn that the church is we. So we determine whether the church grow in grace or grow in grass. We determine whether the church flourish or the church is poor. And we must understand that church is not a job of one man. 
The reason why we call it church is a collective body of authority. Everybody is important. The only reason why the Jerusalem church lack nothing is because they have one thing in common. They eat their bread and share their food with singleness of heart. And any church that do share their food, their resource with singleness of heart, they never go broke. But the church where they argue over money, they fight over things that are not necessary. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Even Christ made it clear to you that if we say that kingdom is divided, this kingdom will soon fall. A kingdom, if a church is divided against itself, men are divided against their master, and a leader divided against his fellow students, the church will soon fall away. There should be need. And don't keep people for too long. Because when people are too mature, they become pagan. It's nice for you to keep disciple until he's able to bear fruit. And when he's able to bear fruit, send him out to make his own disciple. So if he must gossip, he will gossip to his own disciple. So because if you found him to be in subordination for a leader to gossip with those who are under him. But when you keep people of like food together to maturity, they will gossip among themselves. But when you keep people of lower folk with the higher folk, it is almost impossible for them to gossip. And that's why in Christianity, it is better that people that are supposed to be teachers are not kept as converts in your church. This is where we end our teaching for today. God bless you as we listen. If you missed any part of this lecture, you can still watch it. Go to any other our social media network, anyone, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and so on. Type CGF Open Heart Fellowship. Or you go to our website at cgfnslogin.app. cgfnslogin.app. It's also below our comment section. Then you will be able to access our website and have fellowship with us. Don't be disappointed this night by 11 30 to 12 30 pm, one hour with the Lord. It's normally at the last Tuesday of every month, it's our Tarry night where we pray for all Christians and missionaries and where we pray for the church of God, that the grace of God shall abide upon them. I will welcome you if you are interested to join this session. It happens every month. If you have prayer requests during the prayer, just leave it in the comment section where we attend to the prayer while we pray. It's a live program, but you can comment and send us your prayer request. And your prayer request will be prayed for promptly. And God bless you. But if you need our email to send a special prayer request, which is secret or private to you, our email is in the comment section, which is info at cgfnslogin.app. Info at cgfnslogin.app. Brethren, we'll be happy to see you again next week. On Sunday is normally our revelation hour where we use opportunity to study understanding prophecy. This last week, we're dealing with understanding the seal. This coming Sunday, we are going to start by opening the seal. So we will, if you need more insight to understand the whole book of Revelation, that you don't need to dodge it as if we're a big book of mystery, and you want to have a clear understanding, join us every Sunday, 5 p.m. Swedish time. You will be able to join us and understand the entire book of Revelation. While which, in other way, it is every Sunday 17, G, 17 GMT or 5 p.m. Swedish time. So join us and you will be able to have fellowship with us every Sunday on Understanding Prophecy. So we will dealt with Understanding Seal this coming Sunday. Tonight we have our Tarry Night. It's a live program. You can join us. 
is a prayer for all Christians where we join hands to pray for all the saints, especially for the end of the world and for the faith of the Christendom that God should give us grace to live a holy life on this present world. God bless you until we see you next time. But before we conclude, I would like us to close with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. We exhort you for the people that have heard your word. Father, Lord, we said upon this rock you will build your church, and that the gate of hell will not prevail against it. Father, Lord, my God, if there is anyone among us that the gate of hell is prevailing over his business, that the gate of hell is prevailing over his finance, that the gate of hell is prevailing over his church, prevailing over his family, over his children, Father, I come against that gate. And I say it, I bind that gate of hell because the Lord says whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Father, Lord, even as many, because of their sin, they are put in bondage and in the valley of the shadow of death. Father, I say tonight their sins are forgiven, their guilt are pardoned, and their iniquity are taken away. For henceforth, O Lord, they are free. And if the Son of Man set them free, they shall be free indeed. As many that are still sitting in that in bondage, that the God of this world has blinded their heart, that they may not understand the scripture. Father, Lord, remove the veil from their hearts. Let the veil be torn tonight. And let their eyes be opened to see the revelation of Christ. That the ways of the Christ be made manifest to them. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. As many that are sick receive the evangelion. As many that sit in darkness, let the light of God shine into your life right now. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We will see you again tonight by 11.30 p.m. Just go to our link. One of our links on CGF Open House. Click tab light and you will see us there by 11 p.m. God bless you as you come. In Jesus' name, amen.